Hello, Karen. I'm delighted to be chatting with the author of the Tales from Paradise Memoirs. Myself and Steve here, connected. I hope I am. Good afternoon. <laughs> good evening. Yeah, good evening, even. So, uh, Karen. Good. Good. Uh, good evening, even. Yeah. So, how's how's life in? Um, is it Carvero in Portugal? Um, um, yeah. Well done. It? <laughs> what <laughs> I got the pronunciation right. And what was it that made you decide to move this to this? Well, this beautiful area, nice warm country. Uh, I know it's uh, you've got it in your books, but you must have went uh, for a reason in the first place. The our very first visit was, uh, I think, in 1988. Um, a friend of my husband's had just bought a holiday place. And just said to us, you know, we've got a week free at the beginning of October. Um, if you fancy going out there, you know, have a look around, see what it's like. We'd never considered Portugal as a holiday destination. We'd been all sorts of different places. But we thought, OK, we'll, we'll go out and have a look. And we just sort of fell in love with the place. And you speak to so many people here who have the exact same reaction when they come to Carvero. I don't know what it is, um, but we were only here for a week. And I remember driving back through the village very early, sort of seven in the morning on our way back to get our, our flight and thinking, this is the last time that we'll come here. I didn't realize that we'd move permanently, um, but I knew that we would go back again. So, now, I know or I've heard through Terry and on your Twitter uh, profile that you have a disability, and I guess you talk yeah. about this a bit in your book. So if yeah. you're comfortable talking about that, and I assume you are, can you tell us a little bit about it and what it is? Yeah. Uh, the reason I'm asking, one of the reasons I'm asking is I am registered disabled myself, by the way. So. Right, <laughs> right, okay. Um, well, <clears throat> I was diagnosed uh, with a scoliosis, so with a curvature of the spine, when I was kind of 11 or 12. And it was kept an eye on, you know, I'd have six monthly checkups and things. And they decided at that point, um, we're talking, you know, in the 70s, mid 70s or so, that um, they didn't want to do anything. It was too dangerous and they would just leave it alone. Yeah. So I just carried on with normal life, didn't make any allowances for it, assumed that everybody had back pain um <laughs> like I did um but you know I still went on roller coasters and on boat trips that I probably shouldn't have done but anyway after we moved here we moved here in 2003 um early in 2008 I had been sitting at my laptop I, at the time I had a holiday rentals business and so I was on the computer a lot booking people's accommodation um and one morning I just couldn't get up I couldn't get out of the chair I couldn't walk um and we spent the rest of that year um seeing various specialists and having MRIs and whatever and eventually in I think in the August of that year um we were recommended by my physio to a neurologist and he just looked at the MRI and went, wow, this needs surgery. Um, and we saw him privately. The health system here is very different from in the UK. And there's a lot more private health care used here. So we saw him as a consultant. Um, and he said, well, I can't tell you how much this is going to cost. And obviously it wouldn't be covered in insurance because it was a pre-existing condition. Um, yeah. He said, but yeah. I'll put, yeah. put you on my state. <clears throat> I also work for the state. I'll put you on my list at my hospital in Lisbon. So we had to go up to Lisbon and register there. And the following January, I was in surgery from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. Wow. And wow. came, yeah, came out with he told me at the time 10,000 euros worth of titanium which now oh. is my interior scaffolding um 
<laughs> so Nick always says that if things get tough, he'll just weigh me into scrap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but the consequences of that are that um, sitting is extremely uncomfortable, painful. I can't walk very far. I can't walk up and down hills anymore, which is a bit of an issue because Calvary is a very hilly place, mm. anyone who yeah. knows it. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of, I, I haven't driven for quite a few years now. My, my world has got much smaller and I'm kind of 80% housebound and I spend most of my time lying flat on my back. I have an electric bed in the living room and I go from my normal bed to the electric bed. I eat in my electric bed um, and as you can see behind me I have quite a stash of uh, wool and yarn and that's because crocheting is one of the things that I can do when I'm lying down, but there are so many things now that I can't do. Okay. It's sad, isn't it? But yeah. thankful for small mercies, I suppose. But, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, I know where you're coming from. It's not, it's not easy, especially when no. you, you're on your feet one day and the next you're like, why can't I move? That's the scary bit. And then, you know, technology is so much more advanced now than it was then, of course, back yeah. in the seventies, they wouldn't, didn't want to touch you, especially if you were a bit younger. They didn't want yeah. to know, did they? You're too young. Yeah. You're too young. Yeah. 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 But, no, uh, yeah. You know, they, they, they monitored it. And I think they felt it wasn't going to change. But by the time I mm. got to my sort of early 40s, the curve had, um, had obviously got worse. And also the vertebrae were sort of sliding around on top of each other. They, they weren't sitting nicely. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So that was causing a lot of the, the issues. But when I talked to my surgeon um, and said, you know, I'm, I still have a lot of pain, and he just looked at me and said, I didn't operate to take away your pain. I operated to stabilise your spine, and I've done that. And you're oh, on your own. Nice and, I, <laughs> <laughs> and you're on your own two feet. You're not in a, a chair, although I do use a, chair, a wheelchair at times. Um, and he, as far as he was concerned, it was like tick done. But I talk about the operation in uh, the first book because I, I only planned on writing the first book. I, I didn't yeah. plan on the second. Um, but it's not a, a misery memoir and it's not doom and gloom. It's I wanted to pay tribute to some of the people who were so exceptionally kind to me, uh, complete strangers while I was in hospital that did things that just make, made my life completely different. Um, I was in a hospital where no one else spoke English apart from my surgeon. Um, I was just in a, a, a small room, me, one other person, an older Portuguese woman. She didn't speak any English, but we, we managed to talk to each other. Her family would come and visit. They would come and chat to me because obviously I was three hours away from home, so I didn't have um, all that many visitors or anything. Um, and there was another guy as well who um, really went out of his way to be, you know, do way more than he should have done or needed to do. Um, and so I, I wrote about that and I wrote about the lead up to the operation and things that happened which I found really quite amusing so it's it's not all about the pain and the the you know the bits of, of the operation that are a bit gory or whatever it's all about the people I met the journey that I went on and just how lovely people were okay on your Facebook page you have a lot yeah. of time with them um, stray animals some yeah. kind of shelter, a, a charity do you work for? <laughs> no, uh, we just do our own little bit um, yeah. on our own. Yeah. Um, started off, we, we've we always had dogs. Yeah. We brought two dogs with us when we uh, moved in 2003. We rented a, a villa for six months. And during that time, 
uh, a small cat started coming around and we started feeding her. Yeah. Two more kittens turned up. We started <laughs> feeding them. Yeah. One of them turned up one day with his eye like this. He Oof. couldn't close his eyelid. Yeah. It, they were totally feral. We had to find a way of catching them. Um, took us at ages. Eventually we did. Um, got him to the vets. They had to remove his eye. Ah. We had to then keep him in for 10 days while his stitches healed. So we had to keep his little brother. We used to bring him in at night with, so they wouldn't forget each other. Yeah. And from then on, it was as if people followed us around dropping kittens into our garden because we <laughs> found so many yeah. just turn up. Um, and we also feed uh, a little colony of strays and we've had sort of trapped them and neutered and released they're too feral you couldn't you can't do anything else with them um but we look after them and we we go when we walk the dog in the evening we we feed the cats as well and currently we've had the most we've had is i think 18 cats at one time at the moment we have 13 yeah um and i've also bottle fed loads and loads of abandoned puppies and kittens over the years so expensive so, um, cost you a lot, a lot uh, of money yeah 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 but we have a, a fantastic vet who is who has become a friend who i can ring up at any hour of the day or night um and she knows that you know we're a kind of special case yeah. <laughs> of, of of lunatics and um <laughs> we're on the same wavelength you know so it it works out well, she yeah. does me favours, I do her favours sometimes. So, okay. Going back to the books, both of them, yep. they've got nearly 500 reviews, which is <clears> absolutely <throat> brilliant. <throat> is, that, is that the best sort of way to get the books across out there to the public by people who've read the books yeah, posting, you know, an excellent review? Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. If people look at the reviews, they I do. Mean, Honestly, we, we but, chat to so many writers, and the, the main thing they ask for, they say, "Please, please, if you've read my book, can you give me a review?" Yeah, mm. put a review out there. Yeah, I do. I do put. I have written that sort of in the back of the books and put sort of a QR code to the Amazon and ah, yeah. page and everything. Um, obviously, it's it's great if people. I mean, I'm not great at leaving reviews on books that I read. Yeah. So if someone's prompted to write something, then it means a lot because it means that somehow it's touched them. Um, whether they, you know, it's something that they've enjoyed or even if it, they haven't particularly enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, just getting the feedback uh, is good. And I love it when people contact me through my Facebook page okay. um, and, you know, send me comments or send me little messages just to say oh you know just finished the book just mm. loved it just starting the second one or ask me questions about you know what's happening now because um the second book took us up to it was published a year ago in february yeah um and it was kind of bringing our story up to date because as i say i was only going to write the first one um and then i had so many messages surprisingly saying we want to know more we want to know what happened next so the second book covers the next 19 years we've been here 20 years this year yeah. um and covers a lot more of our sort of animal rescue and and basically just our our lives and again people we've met situations we've been in for over the last 20 years okay so is there a third volume of this then? By the sounds of it, I would think there may be. <laughs> the problem is my <laughs> life now is very contained within sort of four walls. Mm. So I don't <clears throat> have the, um, the experiences now. We don't sort of go out and about that much. Um, it's probably, there's probably not going to be a third volume. I I wouldn't think because oh. I'm not quite sure what I would have to say um, compared to, you know, the first two where when I was fit and we were able to 
do stuff, travel, travel to Porto, travel to Lisbon, Cascais, out to Armona. Um, we we can't really do those things now, so I think it would probably be a bit tedious. Okay, Karen, did you keep a diary? Yes, yeah, those things. Yeah. Sorry, Steve. No, no, not really. Um, my parents moved out at the same time, and uh, sadly, my dad passed away um, seven years ago now. Uh, but my mum's still here, and between my recollections, my husband's and my mum's, we managed to sort of piece together a lot of things, and, and we would kind of like, oh, remember that time, yeah. and then work out roughly what year that was. And, um, and actually, Facebook was really helpful because I could go back through all the photos that I posted and know that we got this particular animal on this particular year, um, basically through the, the photographs on Facebook. So that was a good record of things that we'd done and places we'd been. And that's why I've added a lot more photographs on my Facebook page, um, more than I was able to put in the books. Each book's got 10 photographs, yeah. but there's a lot more on my Facebook writer page. You've been approached, or would you have ambition for a film or a television production company? sort of, you know, to take hold for the film rights? I I wouldn't dare to, <laughs> to, to dream about that. <laughs> um, if people just pick it up and read it, it's great. We did have a little, you know, when I first talked about writing and publishing, we did yeah. have this thing of, well, who would pe- play you in, you know, if there was right. a film? Yeah. Um, but we have to remember that it would have, it would be me, 20 years ago Gosh, and actually yeah. if it was including everything in the first book we'd be going right back to 1988 yeah. um, so that would be me at about 23 or 24 yeah. um, and then aging you know so I'm afraid I'm not terribly up with young actors and actresses so I, I can't even think of anyone <laughs> oh, oh you, so you didn't have a name then you didn't put a name who's going to play you uh no i mean i'd love somebody like um helena bonham carter oh yeah, for, yeah. you know yeah but uh, as i say you know we're all getting older yeah and it would have to be somebody that was you know young fit mm. uh slimmer than i am now <laughs> <laughs> oh it's a, happens to the best of us it can ask a change so going off on a different tangent about the mechanics yeah. of your writing do you use yeah. notebooks first of all do you jot things down on your notepad or do you go straight to the keyboard with the writing the first thing that i i wrote was the account of the hospital yeah. bit um purely because i wanted to have it for myself i wanted to have that record yeah of what happened. And I did that probably a couple of years after it happened, maybe 2012. And then that was written longhand, put it in a drawer, forgot about it. During lockdown, we were having a tidy out as lots of people did, I think. You had nothing else to do. And we found loads of old photographs of all our old holidays here. Mm. Um, And I found this piece of writing and I thought, I oh, okay, I wonder. And obviously, going back to 2012, there the wasn't the self-publishing phenomena that we have now, where Amazon, yeah. literally anyone can yeah. write a book and, and publish it. Um, so, and I, again, I, I never imagined that any agent would take me on, or any you know any big publisher would take me on. So. That's why it just sort of went into the draw. But when I went through it and I thought, oh, well, there's other interesting things that I could maybe put into this. Mm. And because I, I can't sit for uh, very comfortably for very long, yeah. I actually wrote the rest of that book and then the second book on my phone on Google Docs. On your phone? What? Finger? finger look. Two thumbs. Oh no! And you wrote that many words. Wow. Just wow! That's um, that's some <laughs> skill you've got there. I can see why you, you're doing the knitting and crocheting. <laughs> Skillful fingers. 
<laughs> manual dexterity. <laughs> yeah, it, it was the only way I could really have a uh, reasonable chunks of time. Yeah. Um, just just uh, to do it, sort of lying down with trying to balance a, a laptop or even a keyboard and an iPad. It's just, um, it, there's so many things you don't think about that make it awkward. And actually on my phone, it's annoying because it does all the sort of uh, predictive texts and stuff. So you have oh, to be yeah. very, very wary of that. Yeah. But um, each book turned out pretty much the same number of words. They're both about 56,000 words. Yeah. Um, but it it just I don't know it just happened. The second one went a lot quicker. Um, but you because... will have improved, don't you? As you go along, the more you write, you know your technique and your skill will, will improve. And I was coming up to things that I remembered more clearly. Ah, yeah. Um, as well, because I was coming up chronologically. The first one sort of jumps back and forwards a little bit in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and ends I, where I thought was a nice kind of place to end yeah. was at the end of our first year here. We had a six-month let in one place, yeah. another six-month let, and at the end of that six-month let, we bought the house that we're still in now. Yeah. And I thought, hmm, okay, I'm just going to write this one book. That's yeah. a good place to finish, that yeah. we're now settled, yeah. um, and, and we've bought this house. But as I say, people then started saying, but what? What happened next? Uh, it ended too quickly. I was looking for another page, and then that, that was it finished. Yeah. Um, so that's why I thought, okay, we'll start again. We'll see if I can find enough material for another book, and eventually I did. Excellent, excellent. Then, Karen, finally, uh, what advice would you give to someone who's writing a book for the first time? Uh, what's the best way to do it? The hardest thing is literally doing it making the time to sit down and write and whichever way you do if it's longhand or if it's laptop whatever I'm terrible at procrastinating the house is never as clean and tidy as when I'm supposed to be writing <laughs> um what I have literally just found this week is um an organization where they have a zoom call it's four times a day so it covers all different time um zones around the world yeah 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 and you you just join the zoom and it's just silence for 50 minutes and everybody just writes and it just you know they start off with a little kind of motivational thing and end the, the same but you just write on your own for those 50 minutes and it sounds a bit simple, but having that um, deadline, if you like, and cutting that 50 minutes out of your day really makes a difference. And I have managed to write, um, since I found this thing, uh, I've managed to write every day, join in, do the 50 minutes, it might be rubbish that I've written when I go back. I don't know, um, but I'm I'm looking at some kind of fiction now, uh, and I've got about four five thousand words started. Um, so that's the main thing is to to actually do it. It's okay. easy to think about it. It's easy to dream about it. There's figures something like. Um, you know, 50 something percent of people would like to write a book, 5% of them do it, 2% yeah. finish it, and 0.5% actually publish it. Um, so, to even get to the point of it being ready to be published, even if it does nothing, even if nobody reads it, you know, there's so few people in out of the you know general pop population that actually managed to get there. So it is just getting into a writing habit. That's the, the most important thing. And somebody, I, I don't know where I, I heard it or read it, 
But somebody said, you know, you wouldn't expect someone to just walk into the Royal Albert Hall and sit down and play the piano as a virtuoso for the first time. Yeah, true. And writing is the same. The more you do it, the better you will get. The more you do it and then you have it edited and okay. you see where so, you're, you've oh, gone oh. wrong, that you need to do that. You need to practice and you you will get better at it. So I think that's the, the thing to remember. Okay, that's brilliant advice. I've never heard of that Zoom thing. That's um, really interesting. I've, is there a link to this? Is there a website or something to that other people can they're have a look called, at? Yeah. They're called LondonWriterSalon.com. Salon as in like a hairdressing salon? Yeah. London Writing Salon. And they call it Writer's Hour. Okay. That's a brilliantly simple idea. I, I it is. We, we chatted to a couple of hundred writers. Nobody's ever mentioned that. Yeah, no. I, let's like I say I only found it recently, and yeah. I, I don't even know where I found it. Yeah. Um, but it works. Excellent. Yeah, I'm, I shall. I shall publicise and promote that by itself. But listen, Karen, <laughs> it looks like a time's caught up with us. I know, and I really appreciate you spending time with us. Um, it, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you. Thank you. And hopefully let's keep in touch and maybe chat again when this fiction novel to all the Zoom calls. <laughs> when you've had, I don't know, 15 more Zoom calls, we'll have another chat and talk about the next book. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to, if if I ever get anywhere with it. Well, it sounds like if you're I'm... going the right direction. <laughs> like I say, it might all be rubbish when I look back at it. I don't know, that's why you read it. Get it on paper. When you say, A lot of people say, I've got a book in my head, but you can't tap a desk with an idea. You can with the pieces yeah. of paper that you printed off. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. That is, and it is the hardest thing to do is to sit down and do it. It's easy not to. Oh gosh, I can I can find a hundred things to do. <laughs> brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. Uh, but listen, the time's caught up. But let's um, let's keep in touch. And thank you very much. And hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. It's actually quite cold here at the moment. Important. So, does that right? Yeah, it does get cold here in the winter. Surprise, but it does surprise a lot of people. Bright and sunny. Yeah. Um, but but quite cold. We have a, a log bar, a log fire, and yeah. the log burner goes on about well about now. I think my husband will be starting to, you know, crank it up now. Okay. Um, and I I'm sitting here with my aircon on heat. Yeah. It's just set to 24 degrees. So, uh, yeah, it does get cold. Okay. You've got an insulated background there with the wool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just wrap myself up in my wool. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's nice having seasons. I do like to have, live somewhere where the summer is the summer. And the winter is the winter, and you know which is which. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's getting with climate change, even in the UK, it's um, you know, strange things are happening. We're getting warm Aprils, cold Julys. Yeah. We don't know. But we definitely yeah. have more of a change of season than you do in, in Portugal, definitely. Yeah. We, well, we have two seasons, really. We don't really have four. Yeah. It's either summer or it's winter. <laughs> it's sort of, yeah. It changes very, very quickly. Okay. Um, and I said to, to a friend in England, Oh, I've just swapped all my clothes over for my summer clothes have gone away and my winter clothes have all come out. And she said she thought that was hilarious. She said, We just have clothes and holiday clothes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. But for <laughs> thank now, you. Cheers, Karen. Thanks. Bye. Bye, bye now. Bye.